Authorities in Calais have begun the operation to dismantle the squalid camp that's been home to thousands of refugees and migrants hoping to make it to the United Kingdom. Since early morning, queues forming in the French port town. As residents of that camp awaited processing, dozens of buses have been commandeered to take them to centres across France where they can begin the process of applying for asylum there. For many, it's the end of their dream of making it across the English Channel. That journey has become progressively more difficult after a series of measures put in place to prevent people boarding UK-bound trucks. The French President Francois Hollande is hoping this is a decisive move that will draw a line under a long-standing problem. But it remains to be seen what becomes of the migrants and whether the sight of people living in desperate conditions in northern France in the hope of making it to England really does become something of the past. For tonight's debate, I'm joined by Marie Martin, who's a Migration and Asylum Programme Officer with Euromed Rights. Thanks for joining us. Shoshana Fine, Research Associate at uh, Sciences Po University here in Paris. In Strasbourg, we have the UKIP MEP, Tim Aker. We'll be talking a little later to Francois Gavin, a Migration Government Specialist, who'll be joining us from Buenos Aires. First, however, we can head to Calais, where our reporter Catherine Norris-Trent has uh, witnessed today's proceedings. Catherine, how did things go? Well, in terms of what we could have expected in terms of any violence or flashpoints, that didn't happen. No arrests, only uh, minor scenes of confusion, a few people pushing and shoving and uh, angry people in the camp, but no violence, outright violence taking place between security forces and uh, people in the jungle. So authorities are racking that up as a success. And we did see people queuing up way before dawn here, uh, wanting to get in line to take one of these French government buses to a reception centre, uh, one of around 450 across the country where they can claim asylum. People are describing it as a relief, saying they just wanted to get out of the jungle, that conditions there uh, were terrible, they couldn't take it anymore, that they were tired. So we did see people taking up this scheme. However, in terms of the numbers, French authorities had been hoping that up to 3,000 people would take buses on this first day of the evacuation, some 60 buses. And from what we're hearing now, now, it still needs to be uh, totally confirmed by officials, but they didn't reach that figure. Um, by 4 p.m., there were uh, 1,600 people who'd left. So that perhaps is not as high as French authorities would like. They're putting a brave face on it, saying that these evacuations are going to continue on Tuesday, on Wednesday as well. But we did see the flow of people queuing up to take these buses, drying up uh, in late afternoon. And we also saw some people heading back into the jungle with their suitcases, saying there were too many people, it was too confusing. They didn't know where to go, uh, and so they were going to try again perhaps in coming days. So it passed off without violent incidents, but there were hiccups here as well. A lot of focus in recent days, Catherine, on uh, unaccompanied minors. Absolutely, and that's still an ongoing concern today. We saw for ourselves and spoke to unaccompanied minors who were having to make the walk from their accommodation on the other side of the jungle camp in, in containers where they've been put uh, as a safer, drier place to stay than just in the tents in the main camp. Well, that's about a mile walk from these uh, reception centres where their details are being taken down by uh, French and British officials. And some of them said that, you know, they had to make that walk on their own. They didn't really know where to go. They didn't have enough information still at this stage. And uh, aid groups have been sounding the alarm, saying that there's just not been information and that this uh, clearing of the jungle shouldn't have taken place before all uh, the cases of unaccompanied minors were resolved and they knew exactly where they were going and taken care of. And what lies ahead uh, for these refugees and migrants? Well, they will now be taken to reception centres across France, around 450 of them in all the regions of mainland France, not including Corsica. And there they will be able to apply uh, for asylum here in France. Obviously, many of them had originally come to Calais because they wanted to cross to the UK. So some of them not too happy about that, but kind of resigned to it now, saying, well, this is the best bet, really. It's become harder to cross to the UK, so they might as well go for this option. Um, there, they will be advised on their legal options. They'll be able to apply to asylum. Assuming that they are granted asylum, then they'll be able to stay in France, but that process could take several months. There's no guarantee that all the migrants here, by any means, uh, will be granted asylum. A lot of them uh, from places uh, that have known conflict, Afghanistan, uh, parts of Sudan, Darfur, but not all of them. Some of them uh, 
will say that they've come here and trying to get to the UK for a better life, to try and get a job because they know people there and they want a better future. So they're willing to find out whether they'll get asylum. There are also other people in the camp I've spoken to, not only today, but in the past week, who say they don't really want to get involved in this scheme, that they're planning, if they can, on staying in the area, perhaps going off into woodland or shrubland and coming back to the Calais region at a later date to try and continue to cross illegally to the UK. So that raises questions about whether this area will, in fact, remain migrant-free, as authorities have wanted, or whether another jungle will just spring up. Thanks very much, Catherine. I'd start by talking to Shoshana Fine, who, I mean, you're aware of the conditions in the jungle. They are terrible. We heard Catherine talking about a few problems on the first day, this operation uh, to, to tear it down. But overall, it's surely good news that the jungle will be no more. I mean, I think absolutely these people are living in terrible conditions. You know, winter is approaching. I think it's normal and a good thing that these people should be sheltered. I think it's, you know, we'll, you know, France is a you know, a rich democracy. It's normal that these people are giving some kind of shelter. Um, what is questionable is the method. And what is questionable is what's going to happen next. Now, there's a lot of journalists there. I think we're talking over 500 accredited journalists who are in Calais, so we haven't seen much violence. And this is really quite out of the ordinary because times when I've been in Calais before, you know, it has been almost like a war zone, the way that this the, the riot police um, are towards the migrants there. So I think, I mean, it's good that they have been kept under control, uh, which I think really is in large part thanks to the journalists. So at least we haven't seen any violence as of yet. Of course, you know, this is the first day we'll see what comes. So I think it's it, it can be a good thing, but it's you know, what is going to happen next? I think we need to Think critically about these reception centres. You know, a lot of migrants and refugees, they don't know what's going to happen there. The government has said orally that it won't double in uh, these migrants and refugees. So the Dublin regulation means that basically when an asylum seeker comes to Europe, they have to make the claim for asylum in the first European state in which they set foot. So a lot of people are quite worried about being sent back to, for example, Italy or Greece. Uh, so we still haven't got any, any written confirmation from the government that this won't happen. And secondly, that these places, how long would they be able to, be able to stay there for? Uh, they're supposed to be temporary measures. So, And then once they've these people have claimed for asylum, those that do claim for asylum, they're supposed to be put into another kind of uh, housing structure. And we've already seen in Paris these camps, we've seen many, many asylum seekers sleeping on the streets, so we can think quite questionably whether these people will be rehoused. Uh, so you can see that these the situation is very unclear and, yeah. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Marie, um, the government assures us that it, it does have a, a plan uh, in place uh, this time. I think it's fair to say that France's approach to the migration crisis has been at times chaotic, but this time, uh, you know, there is this, this idea that these people will be rehoused across the country. There's a proper, a proper system in place now. It definitely is different from the previous years, um, and we welcome that as an organisation. And any human rights organisation will tell you this is most welcome that people are provided shelter because indeed conditions are worsening. We're talking about between 6,000, 10,000 people, depending on the census, which actually is an issue here because we don't know about how many people we're talking I mean, when it comes to the Calaisis area and all the surrounding regions. So the government has tried to take on the challenge, but, and this is a big but because we're talking about individuals, we're talking about human rights, we're talking about unaccompanied minors, but also pregnant women, families. So first problem is we don't know exactly how many people should be relocated. And then the problem is if relocated where, and there's definitely no not enough reception means that have been provided for. And the French government has had a number of months now to get ready for it. So we recognise there's been a huge effort that is very different from the previous years, but it's not enough. And it's not enough in the sense that not only do we say so, but also the Council of Europe that issued a report a couple of weeks back said there's not enough accommodation I mean, available to these people. And this is an issue because winter's coming. It's also an issue because we're talking about vulnerable population. And we don't know exactly what's going to come afterwards because these are temporary shelters. So when it comes to the proper recommendation meant to stay for longer, like reception centres for asylum seekers, we know for a fact that France is lacking the means to accommodate these people for a longer time, I mean, pending the processing with asylum requests. And this is a big worry for us. You sound like 
Um, you, you may also share concerns about what we're talking about there, but about people being Dublined, as it mm -hmm. were, that ending up out, out of France. A bit. I think at the moment the government seems to be trying to reassure people that it will do its best to keep them here, but do you believe them? Well, we know this is a kind of a carrot, right? It's a kind of a way, an incentive for people to embark on those buses and get uh, relocated somewhere. And where, in fact, we welcome the, the possibility for people to go somewhere else rather than in a tent or let's call it a slum because that's what it, it is, uh, really. We don't know exactly if that corresponds to the migratory project of these people, first of all. Uh, second of all, is it really corresponds to where they should be able to integrate if any wish? And whom are we talking about here? Are they all potential asylum seekers? Uh, some of them actually already have refugee status in another country. Some of them have been registered in another EU country. And we know for a fact last year, for instance, that the same argument was used to act as an incentive for what is actually a dispersal strategy used by the government to make these people less visible. But we all know that many people will try their way again to the UK. And this is something that here is missing in the way the government is understanding what's going on in Calais now for, what, 20 years, is the agency of the people we're talking about and their willingness in reaching this and that uh, destination. We question very much the fact that people will not be Dublinized. And we know for a fact that some administration, uh, some detention centers have been reopened in the areas, let's call it Andai, Strasbourg, uh, which are normally not used. So for us, it's kind of a sign that there is this plan of having some people being rejected their asylum requests and from there on being in a deportation process, be it within the EU as of the Dublin regulation or even outside for those who may be returned, which is also an issue. Uh, we know for a fact that there's been some deportation processes going on in regards to some Sudanese people. Okay, we'll bring in uh, Tim Aker now. In the end, of course, this is, this is also Britain's business. Your reaction to what's been going on in Calais today, please. Well, France is reaping the consequences of open-door immigration policies and free movement policies from the European Union. And until France gets its Frexit, uh, this is going to happen. When you are a member of the Schengen area, you have no control over your borders. And let it be a message to the French people that Britain voted for Brexit because of immigration. We've seen alarming numbers of net immigration over the past well, it's 12 years since 2004 when uh, the former Eastern Bloc was admitted to the European Union. And the British people said, no, we've had enough of this. We want to control our borders. We want to decide who we do let into this country. And I think that what we've seen in Calais is a response to it. But bearing in mind, we've got one of the most incompetent Home Secretaries as Prime Minister, Theresa May, who oversaw net immigration levels that were higher than the Labour Party. And people thought they were pretty damn high. Um, we've got to see that the government in the UK is firm. but. We've just seen the government let in these child refugees um, that basically look like adults. I mean, it's a farce. And people have Britain, got to be Britain reassured ought to be capable, that however, Brexit of taking in a relatively small number of people. If as, as part of the efforts to clear well, the camp, been, we're, we're not always, talking about a huge number of people here. We've always been a hospitable country, but when you look at net immigration levels of over 300,000 per year that put strains on GP waiting lists, that add to the council house waiting lists and housing pressures, and as the Bank of England said, has led to wage compression, the British people said enough is enough. And Theresa May will be, has, has raised the bar very, very, very high. She's always been a Home Secretary and a politician that always over-promised. Every, every year the immigration figures would come out and they would be at record levels, but she'd go to the Conservative conference and say, no, 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 we've got control over it. Well, now she is in the hot seat. And if she doesn't deliver, the British people will give her her P45. Tim Akers will be coming uh, back to you a little bit later in the debate when we talk about uh, the politics of what's going uh, on in Calais. Um, Frexit or no Frexit, I don't think it's on the agenda at the moment. The, the reality is that there, there are real concerns that there will be another jungle, if not in the same place. There will be other camps developing along the coast, further inland. There already are a few hundred uh, a little further inland from Calais. Is this kind of cosmetic surgery in a way? 100%. I mean, I think it's really quite ironic because what we can see is going on here is on the one hand, this politics of invisibility. So really, Hollande is trying to destroy the camp as quickly as possible. So within a week, we want to get rid of these people so that there is no migrant presence in Calais. And on the other hand, but he, he knows, we, we all know that this has never worked. And of course, they're going to come back because as you mentioned earlier, people have projects, they want to go to England for other reasons. So I really see what's going on here as a kind of border spectacle. It's really to send a message
message out to the French population. We have these ele the elections coming up saying, you know, we are in control. If we want to get rid of these migrants and refugees, if we want to make them invisible, then we will do so. For, for me, it's more of a communication strategy. As such, it's quite a risky strategy for Hollande. You know, you've had right wing politicians saying we need this problem sorted, as you say, in the run up to elections in all likelihood. <laughs> Maybe not another jungle in the same place, but some similar camps near, nearby. People will take pictures of them. They'll get on TV. It might end up it's, not looking good for him. It's a short-term strategy. I really think, like many politicians, he's not alone. They're really trying to... It's a performative strategy. He's trying to show that he's doing something, taking control of France's borders. But, of course, we know that this has never really worked. Every time that across Europe, whenever we've tried to close a border, migration hasn't stopped. People just end up taking different routes. And what are the consequences of this? Well, smugglers are getting more business and people are taking more and more dangerous routes. Why have, I think, 500 more migrants have died this year than next year? We keep talking about migrant deaths, but it's not getting any better. More migrants are dying at sea. And this is a direct consequence of these policies. Marie, if, if there's a border there, I mean... Unfortunately for the French, the British border is, mm -hmm. uh, is, is on their soil. But if, if there's a border, it's going to attract migrants in the end. It's been 20 years. I mean, as Shoshana mentioned, actually, I mean, the, the Sangat protocol dates back to 91. So it's, it, it's an old recipe being used and reused. And we know it's actually not going to change anything. That being said, uh, to come back to what was previously mentioned, um, Britain voted for Brexit because of immigration. That's true, and that's because the polls have been completely manipulated against when, in fact, the debate was about whether Britain wanted to stay in the EU or not. It's nothing to do with immigration when, in fact, we're not even talking about the same population here. Those being in the Calais area are not the same as those are we talking as being those in mass numbers, if any, in the UK. Um, but as regards border control in the EU, it's hardly been so tight when you think about it. When it comes to the direct control, indirect control, the controls that actually are outside of the European Union. And what are we talking about today in terms of figures? I mean, 80,000 asylum seekers in France for 2015. That's hardly anything more than the year before. We don't face what people call mass influx. And no, no matter what populism wants to make it look like, it's absolutely not an invasion. It's something that we can manage, that we can actually benefit from. So it's absolutely ridiculous to speak about these numbers in these terms. And it's also very despicable for the people. It's very diminishing for the people who may have wanted to project. And actually, under the law, EU law, have rights and should be respected their rights. Mary Martin, we'll come back to this subject very shortly after this quick break. <laughs> 